I'm thrilled to introduce you to our panel today. Starting off with Jackie McKee. Jackie is the Director of Facilities for the Los Angeles LGBT Center, overseeing nine locations, 600 plus employees, and a clinic exceeding 42,000 patient visits per month. Prior to moving to California from New York, Jackie was the Director of Operations for a family of companies providing disaster restoration, construction, maintenance, and consulting services. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Jackie. this morning, I was not sure what was appropriate, so this is it. <laughs> because from the time when I was a contractor to the time where I flipped to the other side, and by that I don't mean the transition, I mean going to work for somebody else as opposed to having my own company, and then being in the field and, you know, the person up on the roof in the rain and the snow back in New York, to this, I don't know what was happening industrially or corporately in all that time I spent on the ladder, but I can tell you that in my world, where I was, with the power tools and the trucks and all that stuff going on, this could not exist when I was, you know, getting my feet wet in the business. It, there was an ocean of testosterone, which wasn't enough to flip me to that side. Um, I always knew I was trans, but the conversations, the attitudes, and the unbelievable lack of women in this industry. I never met any in all my time. I met one facilities director one time who was female, and she had only gotten that because there was nobody else, and they told her that was her responsibility now. She was a housekeeping manager who just shoved into the role. So to see that from then, and this is going back maybe to the early 90s, to today, when I could be in a room like this and see all of you and people I look up to, like I work with Karen from Saban Clinic. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to embarrass you, Karen, but I look up to Karen. 
around. She's a facilities director for a big clinic, you know, and see, I'm going to embarrass you too, Cassie. Cassie was my property supervisor, who I keep saying will have my job really soon, right, if I'm not careful, to see the growth that this is where we are now. It's exciting for me to see that. And I don't think I did anything to help make that happen, but I am excited like a little kid at Christmas to see that it is happening. I think that uh, 20 years ago when I was in school, in architecture school, it was very different than, than what we have today. And I know we're not there yet, but the progression, I don't think I was even out in school. I, there wasn't such thing for us to have, so I just remember all my friends, everybody, even uh, people who were dating, let's say somebody from the same sex, but you couldn't talk about that. It was just something that we, we just all just went to studio and did our thing. I think the hardest thing that came out of that was when we graduated, went to work for firms, and you had to bring a spouse to the Christmas party. How do you deal with something like that? Because we couldn't have spouses back then. So um, I just happened to have to be lucky enough to be with the firm that I'm at, and the bosses were so receptive, and they were just so great. And you know, and at other firms, it was not like that, especially the ones from Texas. And, you know, you just, uh, and I'm not saying anything wrong with Texas, but at the time, we just, uh, it was a different world. And, yeah. So my name is Catherine Perez Delano, and I'm with Arab, and I kind of have a very different story. Um, and I do appreciate the two men that are here. Um, I appreciate that. I know, I, I love the two men too. Uh, because I think this is more than just a, a women issue, this is a people issue, you know, stuff that we're going through. And and uh, I'm a person who was um, married, um, have three children, uh, my ex-husband and I, he's my only husband, um, but he is a wonderful human being, great father to my, my children. But I came out, I really didn't come out, I just started uh, dating my, my future wife uh, after uh, divorcing my husband, but I just did that. I just started that without thinking about what it meant for other people. Um, but then we got married and I added her name to my name and it was interesting the response from lots of people. Why didn't you do that when you were married to your husband? And I said, well, I didn't, it didn't seem appropriate. Whereas this, married to my wife, I had to. I wanted to claim my marriage to my wife and I didn't want anybody questioning its authenticity. So that's why I have like the longest name um, it goes on and on, and, and it keeps, I'll get to the question and answer very quickly, but the thing is, is that I ran for state senate last year, and I want to say that that was, um, I, I was married, I, I, I was running my successful company, it was my, my kids were getting ready to go to college, it was a great time, and, and I decided to do this. Um, it was absolutely the hardest decision that I had to do for myself because it became about you, right? I mean, it's not like, oh, I'm going to go support you for doing this. It's like, you got to go raise the money. It's all on you. It's all about you being able to do it. And at the end of the day, you're by yourself. So I said, like, okay, I'm going to do this. I have the support of everybody. But I got to tell you, last two years ago, so I decided two years ago, people would say, well, you can't run out. Did you see my name? My name is like really long. That's her name. I can't hide that. I'm not going to. Well, you can't run it out. Well, fine. This was Pasadena, Burbank, Glendale. It goes all the way to Pomona. It's kind of a little, you know, parts of it are a little bit less progressive. And so they said, well, maybe you should move to Venice. I'm like, I'm not moving to Venice. I'm going to run here. And then they said, well, um, you know, kind of like just don't bring it up for a while. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. I've got all these kids. My wife and I have six kids together. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. I have this family. I'm not going to run away from who I am. I'm either going to run authentic, 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 <laughs> authentic to myself, or I'm not going to run. The reason why I decided to run, and I have three points, and I'll get to your answer really quickly, if possible, is one, you got to own your own power. We all have our own power. Two, you have to be persistent. You have to resist what's going on in our world today. And number three, you have to challenge yourself. 
You get comfortable and you're just, you can't let that happen. The world is, life is too short and the world is too complex. You have to keep pushing and challenging yourself. So this was my time to challenge. And I said, okay, there's no Latinas in the state senate of California. That's wrong. And I had a great chance to, to do this and I need to take the chance. And if I didn't take the chance, I would have hated myself because I knew I had a chance. And if I knew I had a chance, then I had to do it. So my story is different because I not only came out, I, 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 I'm out, I live out, and I operate and live my life comfortably saying wife all the time, which my wife is getting used to, but I am still perplexed as to how little diversity is in our field of planning, real estate, construction, development, all of it. And I say that with the kind of frustration of teaching at both USC and UCLA for the last almost 10 years, pumping students out of planning, real estate, development professionals. Half of my classes are women and people of color. And yet we don't have that representation in our field at the highest levels. It is absolutely something we all must change because without our perspective in the room, Things don't happen. And I just really want you to take a look at what you're doing and question, okay, what can I be doing to facilitate opportunities, not just for myself, but for others? So the answer, Mom, is that it's, it's bad, but it's not gotten a lot better. And I've been at this for far too long. So, I mean, I think the thing is we need to, and I, I do, I raise the flag because we have the added challenge of being mostly the caregivers. You know, usually you have to kind of take some time and we lose a lot of our talent while they're slowing down to take care of those things and then having to gear back up. And so we have to make that room for people to be able to do those other things in their lives and to, you know, to have those chapters of their, of their whole professional and personal story. But we have to make sure that we support each other. So that's the big concern I have, is that we don't have the women at the levels of executive leadership that we should, and certainly not the diversity at any level. At the, you know, by the way, for those of you going to ULI next week, prepare yourself. Just prepare yourself. <laughs> I ran ULI LA for like three years. Prepare yourself. <laughs> There's no lines in the ladies' room. Just saying. <laughs> Uh, I guess the biggest pressing question now is if you had to choose between USC and UCLA. <laughs> I got that question over there. I'm not going to answer. Because I went to UCLA and I teach at USC and they both have their great attributes but they both have their equal challenges. I'll hear about that here. But, uh, <laughs> so, to follow up a little bit, so the human rights campaign uh, we used to study in 2009 that suggests that 53% of LGBT individuals paid who they were at work. And the idea of, of being closeted is, takes a lot of energy and anxiety. Uh, I know you three have had very different experiences, but would any of you would like to share that experience? Like, did you have an impact on your performance or your behavior at work? Sure, and I'll start. Because again, you need perspective, right? Um, I'm sorry, is that better? Yeah. yeah. I'm so well, sorry. My apologies. I usually don't need a mic because I'm from Brooklyn and I'm Italian. <laughs> so I'm trying to not get in trouble for using my outside voice, but I'll be more cognizant. Um, but yeah, again, having a unique experience, you know, and a unique perspective on this, starting out where I started out, I was always afraid, and I didn't transition for the longest time. Like I always knew, right? I mean, four years old. I'll say five because people don't believe you when you say four, but I always knew who I was, right? Right out of the gate. Always knew, but back then, I'm a child of the 60s, there was no vocabulary for this. You grow up in a strict Italian Catholic family, I mean, like these things are not even mentioned, right? This is like black magic type of stuff, so I always kept it hidden because I feared the consequences of coming out and saying who I was and how I felt and what I wanted to be. And those consequences stayed with me all through my adult life. You know, when I started working, 
well, you can't just all of a sudden show up at work one day looking like this, when the day before you were in a business suit with a tie and people stood up in a room when you walked in. That's too much of a change. And then when I got heavy into this field, it became, well, I had a responsibility to be effective. And if I come out, I'm going to lose my effectiveness. So I was always afraid of the consequences. Because on top of not being effective and having a difficult time at work, when you come out, you can lose family, right? You can lose friends. You can lose your job, right? Until very recently, that was a real consequence. So I stayed under wrap. It was mentally exhausting. I had bad relationships because of it. And I will cop to that being my fault for not being genuine and honest. And I lived that until probably I was in my late 40s before I decided to come out. And then I decided to come out because I started to fear the regrets more than the consequences. And I knew there were going to be consequences. And it all happened. I did lose family and I did lose friends. Surprisingly, some people I thought I wasn't going to lose, I didn't. I mean, I wasn't going to lose, I didn't lose. And other people I thought that would be good with the transition really weren't for whatever reasons. And there was all this misunderstanding because this is kind of new, right? I mean, people I think are a little bit more used to um, someone being gay or lesbian, but trans is kind of a new thing. We walk down the street, we stick out, right? So people look at us differently. And this is a much bigger leap for people because transition isn't your own. Transition is for everybody in your world. Everybody else has to learn how to respond differently. So what I did, the way I, I responded in that, I became a workaholic. I made sure my job performance blew everybody else out of the water because I had to prove what I wasn't. And then when I transitioned, that's a process you know, that I think probably will never end. I had to do that all over again because dealing in this industry, this testosterone driven industry, all of a sudden I found, whereas before I was given respect automatically because of how I was dressed and how I spoke and how I carried myself, now I look different. I had to fight for it all over again and that was not a pleasant thing. I'm like, well, I have something to say, damn it. <laughs> Listen, fortunately, what I did find is, you know, when you're, you're trans and you meet people, I always joke, they have two physical things they need to get over. They all have really big eyes, and they all have curved spines, because everybody kind of leans back, and they're like, whoa, <laughs> what's this? But then when you start talking to people, and you start having conversations, and you know what you're talking about, they get past the window dressing, but it takes that extra effort, and that was a growth experience for me. I had to learn to accept that this was going to be the process, because people don't know this, and they certainly don't know me, but once they get to know me, we're good. I don't know how to follow that. Which <laughs> <laughs> is amazing. Um, what was the question? <laughs> No, no. Just, and if I'm going too long, I have to have some I said that, right? I, tell you, I can go on for hours. Cut me off. I expect that. Well, to, to, to further this question, so in, in part, how have you seen um, like your sexual or your gender identity impact your performance? Brittany, you put it way up. I am here. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, in part, I think uh, the great question is, is not to applaud myself for a great question. How have you seen your sexuality or your gender identity impact your performance at work, either before or after coming out? As well as like in terms of building relationships as you, you've embraced this level of authenticity, have you seen an impact on your professional connections or your ability to connect with people? Can I go ahead? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so half my time at the, in the, during the week I spent on construction sites. So what you were mentioning, there are not a lot of women. I'm pretty much the only female in the trailer. And I think it's uh, just like a week ago, one of the contractors saw the ring on my finger and said, oh, what does your husband do? And I just did not want to answer that. I, 
I just change the subject quickly because I know that one, I, either I tell them that it's a woman and then they really, I don't know what's going on through their minds, but they want to know more about that or they happen to know somebody that's also gay and they have to tell you about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, my best friends, oh my god, my cousin and my nephew and it's just like, okay. So I just don't talk about it. I think the greatest part that I, that going to construction site and being the only woman is having your own private porta potty because they keep a lock on that and it's always clean. Well, most of clean. But they don't let any of the guys in and I think that um, just that says something about what happens at construction sites and what you mentioned about how you used to do construction and there was no women around. So I don't know if that, the whole percentage of lesbians or women or gay at a construction site, it's because of the percentage of women at construction sites is very minimal. And just hearing the guys talk during the meetings, and it's just like, I, you know, you have to keep quiet. But then they also treat you differently because you're a woman. And, and I just don't want to, I don't have a feeling to get personal with them. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm okay. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think about them. I don't because <clears throat> I just don't want to hear it. So I, you know, just do our job and do a good job and, and just try not to, um, you feel different as a woman on a site. You wonder, like, do they want to do this? Do they think that a man would do a better job? Or, you know, all those thoughts go through your head. Just have to be so She is so lovely. It's so lovely. <laughs> I mean, you're just so cool. Why? Just be cool. I mean, I mean, Jackie and I are like, I, mean, I can tell you, she was just so quiet. I think what's so hard is that my wife is very much, you know, she doesn't talk about this, she just lives it, she just is. And and I I feel I feel like it's really important. I did it still after I, I started dating my wife. I said, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna cut my hair and I'm not gonna stop wearing lipstick, honey. And I'm gonna still wear, wear high heels. I still am gonna be who I am, in other words, and I don't know how to be anything else. So it's amazing how now I don't get hit on by men very much at all. But when I was married to my husband, it was open season. And I don't even understand that. You know, it was like I'd be, you know, rings and everything. It's like, well, why don't we grab a drink after? I'm like, why? You know, why do I want to do that with you? But the thing is, is that now that I'm authentic, I must emit this energy like, just don't try. Just don't think about it. But, you know, because it is important to me, even when I, you know, when I first started at ERA, all of our lovely male engineers, I love them all, but a lot of the guys would say, so, what does your husband do? And, and I, you know, and I love ERA, I gotta tell you, um, after I read, and I love this place that I work because, and I love my colleagues here who have come to support us, um, when I finished running for state senate, and by the way, if you ever decide to run for office, Please talk to people about that idea. I encourage you to do it, but it is a huge sacrifice. It is an important thing to do because we all need to be like in the room helping make important decisions for all of us. Um, I remember telling, just a joke, I remember telling the state senator, um, the Senate pro tem, Kevin DeLeon, who's now running against, I guess, Diane Feinstein. I remember going in to tell him, I'm going to run for office, I'm going to run for state senate. And he said, oh, well, why don't you tell me when you've decided you want to go do that? I'm like, no, Kevin, I've decided I'm going to run. And I said, I'm sorry it's inconvenient for you. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and, and he said, well, this is really hard. You know, I've already endorsed somebody else in your race. And I said, well, number one, I didn't come and ask for your permission. I didn't come and ask for your endorsement because I knew you gave it two years ago. I came to tell you because you're my friend because you're my friend and I want to stay friends with you even after this race. But my point to all of this is that I, I t he asked me, are you going to run as a lesbian? I said, I'm going to run who I, as, as me. I'm going to run as me. And that is part of me. And so he said, well, this is going to be very interesting. I said, yeah, isn't it? So when I, when I, didn't, when I didn't make the runoff, and I thank God, because then I'd be dealing with Trump all day long, and I would just hate that. So I didn't make the runoff, but when I had the time to decide where do I want to go, this is one of the things I really want to impress upon women in professional spaces. Really, don't take the first offer. Go for the right opportunity for yourself. And I remember a woman who ran for governor told me that. 
I sat down with Kathleen Brown, who used to be our Secretary of State Treasurer, and she said to me, Catherine, you know, don't wait for the first offer. Wait for the right offer. And that's what I got out of Eric. And, and I gotta tell you, the support I have received from them has been phenomenal. And, and working with a lot of men in our offices all over the place has really been wonderful. And I easily drop the, I say, you know, my wife and I have this house, and blah, 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 blah. And I just let them, like, okay, got it, okay. Um, you know, just let it, like, sink in, right? You let it, like, okay. And then I just move right on. But it's just been very interesting. As they first met me, they would say, so what does your husband do? And I got that a number of times. And I'd say, my wife, my wife, my wife. And very quickly, but just, it's just, it takes a little bit of extra work. But unless I do that, and I feel like, and, and at certainly at, at my level within the office, unless I do that, I just feel like I'm not helping change the industry. I need people to understand and appreciate that when I got the flowers, because my wife was saying sorry, that, oh, you know, why? Why'd you get flowers? He said, those are sorry flowers. <laughs> Everybody saw them, they were huge. And I said, you know what, yeah, this is a normal relationship, and we go through these things together the same way. And so I just, I'm tr I feel like I'm a little bit on an education process with everybody, but it is one of the most wonderful things. So I am noisy, and, and I appreciate, so I, I, I respect that. I respect that we're all kind of on our own journey. No, and I, I think I understand exactly what you're saying, but I think I got to the point where I used to be like that, and especially in the early 90s, and, well, yeah, mid 90s, and uh, early 2000s. But then I said, you know, after things happened, this uh, state, because I think California is very different from the rest of the country, then I was just like, I can't, I don't want to hear it anymore, and I just, you know, you can come and face it to But I, I don't know what you mean, I'm still active. Well, you're here. Just, just there, I just don't want to deal with that some of these. It depends on which construction site you go to, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if I can just tap on to that, you are so right, because it's exhausting. Yeah. It's absolutely mentally exhausting having to always have that extra conversation. Everything should be given, right? You have your job to do, people have their responsibilities to meet your job done, right? Except it's not. And for me, I find it's really hard sometimes not to devolve into who I used to be, because I used to be maybe not so nice sometimes when it took a little bit of ass kicking to get stuff. I was stuff. wondering about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was taken seriously off the bat, and not because I was mean or anything, but I had my standards and people knew what they had to do, and that just came automatically because of how I carried myself and the fact that I wore a suit or a hard hat way back when, right? It just, it was given, it was, it was expected. And then when I first transitioned and I'm dealing with people and I've actually used this phrase, and like I said, it's kind of hard to not devolve, and I just left it at this. But I have more than once thrown invoices back at contractors and told them, don't let my pretty eyes fool you. I know my <laughs> shit. <laughs> Rework the invoice. But that's exhausting to have to always do that. And so sometimes, not that I took that invoices, but sometimes, yeah, you just let it go. Sometimes it's like, I just don't have the energy to make you more of an accepting adult. I just don't. I wish I did for everybody, but I don't. The only way I think we can successfully do that is just being us out there and let people sing it and not being afraid of the different. Because what's different we don't like or we're fearful. And I think maybe that's, that's the better way to do it than the constant trying to convince people over and over and over again. So I get both your points, or they're, they're both right. God, you guys are so cool. <laughs> uh, I'm personally speaking, it's my the world to see Catherine in, in the Arab office. Uh, to, to see someone who's so outspoken and this like, badass leader, and who's not a straight white man. Uh, and so I, I, that, that being said, have you guys seen anyone occupy the space in your firm or in your professional network before you? Um, and I guess alternatively, uh, as young women join your company, is, is there anything that you want them to know? 
you have with the buffet system. Okay, I'm not shy, right? You get that? <laughs> first one at the buffet. <laughs> you want to be behind me. <laughs> but yeah, and, and again, you know, so I transitioned, I work at the LGBT Center, right? And that's, that's a pretty safe place to be doing what I do, right? So lucky me that I was able to get that opportunity to do what I do. But again, you know, going in, the person who I was replacing, I got to know for a few months before she retired, and it was a woman facilities director who have been there just shy of 20 years. And I was just saying this at our table before we started. And we used to talk a lot. We used to swap war stories, because that's what we do, right? It's shop talk. And she would talk about how incredibly hard it was to be in this business. She was an electrician. She was a, a licensed electrician. To be in this business 20 years ago, before it was really cool to be gay. And how hard it was for her to be functional and to get things done, and not just with outside contractors, but even within the facility. Because even people in the community looked at her as something different because she was just this facilities director. Like, that was incongruous. So she had a real battle that she fought. And I remember we were driving back from a new site we had opened, and I told her, thank you, because you, know, you laid the groundwork for someone like me who came out in life. I'm reaping the benefits from what you went through. Not that we're there. You're totally right, Kendra. We are far from where we want to be. But the fact that that could even happen to open a door to somebody like me to go in, is just like, how do you say thank you for that? And then to see, again, someone like Cassie, who is this young millennial who gives a lie to everything about millennials, and there's all this time, and I don't mean to embarrass you, but you're the perfect example of someone who's up and coming in this world and will own it. And will own it, and hopefully be where I was 20 years ago, where nothing else matters but the quality of the job. That's exciting stuff. Before we move on, let's just uh, repeat the question, because I think I'm accidentally whispering up here. Uh, so uh, what I've asked, and, and Jackie has graciously answered, was have you seen people occupy this space before you? And as these young women are joining firms, uh, your firms, what would you want them to know? So when I started in my in the industry, there was, I did not have any mentors or anything. So there was nobody that was out that I could look up to. And like I said, I was lucky enough to have great bosses, so I was able to slowly myself come out um, and introduce my partner and all that. But today, I know that in the last 10, 15 years, I've worked with a few people that have since come out, and I actually just went to a wedding between two women. Just When I met one of the women at another firm, she had straight and now she's with the love of her life and is another female and it's like great to see everyone have the opportunity to be able to uh, come out and, and be part of that, that, that this industry and be part of who they are and um, and I know that we, we try to put together groups um, of just you know gays and architecture and design and, and we meet at, at uh, gay bars and stuff and I, I guess we should be more inclusive <laughs> Certain people wanted to join us, and we said no for, at first. <laughs> they were like, okay, you know, let them let others come. And, and so uh, we are being more open about it and uh, letting people come. But I know that we also have this, uh, there's so few of us in the industry that we still want to have this opportunity to meet together and, and just talk about what's happening around us. And so the, I think it, we are growing, but we are very far from being equal. I mean, just a quick story, just uh, a few months ago at the, one of the construction sites, we all went outside the trailer because we had to look at a female construction worker who was laying down the bar. Wow. She was the only one out of probably 50 men, and she was, and was like, let's well, look at this. And it was, it was not me, but the guys were all like, oh my god, there's a female worker out there. And she, very sad. I mean, it was sad, but great that she was doing it. And I mean, crap, I don't know she is, but it's not just in the now. Like a unicorn. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody found a unicorn. Yeah. But we got to all go see it. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I know. 
I mean, I, I just, uh, so just a very, the reason why I had to come out was because I knew one of my twins was, was gay. And one of my daughters, I have like, identical <coughs> twins. And um, when she was in utero, and I have lots of friends who are pregnant right now, you kind of know about your child. And one of my twins was gay. And I knew that. And I said to my husband, I said, this one's gay and this one's complicated. <laughs> and, and they came up just like that. So, so, so I knew, I knew, and I, this is like the weird, painful thing about being a parent and also having secrets, is that I knew when she was 10, I'm like, well, actually, I knew when she was 5, I said, I'm going to have to deal with what I knew was my secret, because I knew. And I told my husband who I was dating, I said, I'm telling you, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm much more interested in getting women's phone numbers than getting men's phone numbers and bars. And he said, well, we'll work on that together. Like, oh, God. You know, he's such a renaissance man. I love him, but my gosh. Um, just thinking about that. But then I said, I, gotta, I have to come out because she cannot do what I did. Right? She can't. So I came out, um, and it was very painful. It was very difficult. But... I knew, she, I knew when she was 14, she came to me and she's crying, my daughter's crying, and she says, Mom, I want to tell you something. I'm like, yes, sweetheart. <laughs> and she says, well, you already know. I said, Mia, I do. And she said, okay. And she walked away. <laughs> that was it. Like, she came out. And she never actually came out, but that was it. I was like, okay. Um, and consequently, both my twins who are identical are dating women. And I'm like, go. That's wonderful to be able to explore in this time, I never had that chance. I'm like, please go and try everything you can because I think that that is where we're at. And so the question about women and women of color and diversity and LGBTQA, in my office, I go to them. And I'm like, I want to know you. I want, who are you? Let's sit down. Let's grab some coffee. I want to meet you because I want to be a resource for you. Because if you need help and I can help you, I will help you. And so I teach a lot. I have a lot of mentees. And I make time for my mentees, particularly if they need references, but I always try and, like, my friend used to say, you have big wings. And I try and put my little chips under my wings. And it's like a, it's pollitos in Spanish. It's like my little pollitos. And I, I just, it's really important to me because it is, I, as I'm getting older and I'm, like, going through these, you know, other chapters, I'm like, it's not moving fast enough for me. This is not moving fast enough. So I want to ask you, all of you, to just kind of look at your own lives. Um, lots of people come to me and say, hey, I have an LGBT, I have a kid who's trans and I need some help. Hey, I need, I have a daughter who's going through some stuff and uh, she's cut off her hair and she's, you know, taping her breast down. I'm like, okay. You know, I'm, I'm trying to be a resource to all my friends who are going through these issues. And we just need to help each other. So the thing that I try and do is when we do get new people in our office is to not look at them and assume anything, because you can't. I go to them and I just want to meet them and to be able to be a resource and say, hey, you know, I've walked a few more steps in front of you and maybe I can help you. So that's what I try to do. Shifting gears a little, I think a really tangible way of how these topics intersect with the built environment and the design of it is through the restrooms and the design of the restrooms. And Jackie, within the design of the new LA LGBT Center, you've been engaged in creating all gender restrooms. Uh, would you speak to the complexities you've run into? How many hours do we have? <laughs> Sorry, how many hours do we have? Uh, yeah, and again, from a unique perspective, I can tell you categorically, the world is not a safe space, okay? Especially for someone who is trans, I have had to plan where I will go to the bathroom if it was an option. I have gone so far as to skip morning coffee so I would not be in a situation where I might have to use a bathroom because it's maybe not safe where people just aren't comfortable with it. So this is a real issue. And, and I can go on for hours about that. I won't, because I respect your time as much as I do my own. But this, this is a real thing, that making the place safe, making that built environment inclusive, that's a really complicated issue. And for us, we're building a new canvas, for those of you who don't know. It's called the Anita, Anita Mae Rosenstein canvas. It's going to be a 160,000 square foot building. 
with senior housing and youth housing and administration. It's going to be the flagship building for us, largest LGBT center in the world. So now it's complicated because not only are we constricted by building code, we are told what restrooms must look like. We know there have to be so many laboratories, so many stalls. By code, how many urinals have to be put in there? And yet, people will look to us for leadership. They'll want to know what we're doing so that they can emulate that. So for us, it's not just that we can go slap an all-gender sign on the door and be done with it. There are some real design issues to make this successful. The complications are a lot. At first, how do you please everybody? Because we want to be inclusive, right? So if we have gender, neutral restrooms. Maybe not everybody wants a man in their bathroom. You know, I was sharing on one of our phone calls, I use a restroom right around the corner from my office, and those are gender neutral, but they used to not be gender neutral. And you kind of get used to going into the restroom you always use. And I remember the first time I walk out, and there's a man in there. And I was like, oh, whoa. <laughs> Double take. I don't know if I like this. It just felt odd. And that's coming from me. If you think anybody is <laughs> like not care, and I don't care philosophically, but it caught me. So the whole culture of going to the bathroom with your girlfriends or your partners and talking, was like that's all going to change if it's full of men, right? So what does that mean, right? To be inclusive. How do you maintain privacy in a restroom? So now we start getting into things like full privacy stalls. Right? Well, maybe that helps, but that adds to a cost. We talked about, on a phone call, for me, one of the things I think of when I think of um, equality in bathrooms, having been on both sides, I can promise you in my old life, I never waited on a line to use a restroom. In, out, back at the bar before the second half of the concert starts, right? But in my new life, I'm looking at my watch before intermission going, I better get going now. Because I know I'm going to miss the first 15 minutes of the second half by the time I get back. So what does that inclusiveness look like? What does that equality look like? We, I've done research, and there are urinals for women. Okay, but is that something everybody feels comfortable using in the same way men use urinals? If you see the pictures, you'll get what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jackie, I'm like, how does that work? It, it's out there. Okay. They use them in Europe, but yes. just looking at the pictures, and we don't have to get graphic here, but you can imagine the complications. So is plopping urinals for women, does that make it equal? So there are all these questions, all of them. How do we make it equal? How do we make it safe? It's much more than signage. We're working with our architectural firm to figure this stuff out, and it may be that the only answer we can do because of the constraints of what code tells us we have to do is to do the best we can within the existing structure, like putting up full privacy stalls and a bank of sinks. And one of those restrooms is going to have urinals for people who feel so inclined, but if you're the woman in there, I guess broaden your horizons, you know? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Like, if that's really the answer, so this is a work in progress, even for us who know that people are looking to us for leadership on it. Thank you. Have you, uh, either of you, seen this intersect with your work? I mean, in March 1st, this year, California became the first state to require all single uh, occupancy bathrooms to be gender neutral. So I was just going to say, and I don't know if you, can, you both have any of you have kids on this, so I'm fine with it. You know, go all gender. I don't care. I was at this event, and it was a, a Equality California, actually, event. And they put the all gender bathrooms up there. And I'm walking in, and there's men at the wash basins, there's women at the wash basins. We all got along. We all, I think, you know, I think parents, sometimes parents get really nervous about children. And I can understand that there's a sensitivity. But I also think we're at a place where there is, um, we're, we're moving into a new era. And Jackie, and I think you're right, where we're, it's, a, it's an uncomfortable time. It's time to have uncomfortable conversations, frankly. This is a, a time in the United States that I think is where we need to actually have our voices be heard. And right now, to me, to get wigged out on bathrooms is just really, you know, I think it's important, but I think for me, I am ready to just 
walk into a bathroom, if there's if it's a bathroom with men and women, I, I kind of okay with that. Maybe I'm just on the other side of it. Maybe I'm just kind of really, really don't care because I've seen everything and you know I've really seen everything. I don't I don't need to. Uh, I, I don't I don't have a fear of that. I have a fear of my rights being taken away. I have a fear of somebody kind of taking something that I am I am entitled to away from me. So having a bathroom where it's all gender and everybody's decent and cordial to each other doesn't wake me out. Maybe I'm wrong. No, I, I agree with everything you're saying. I just was, I'm just stuck on the whole um, fixture count for women whose bathrooms and, and male bathrooms. It's it's a difficult situation. It's, it's as you do have, and, and the, yeah, and the, the city will ask you to show them your fixture counts, and, and I'm like, that's the custom that's such a difficult thing to work with, because how do you go to the city and explain to a plan tracker, this is what my breakdown is, and we have an all-gender bathroom, and it's not part of the fixture count, because it's not the women's bathrooms, it's not the urinals, and what do you do? So I'm, I'm that's Coke for sure has yeah, not caught up to the conversation. And, they won't and, just, and Kevin, to your point, you're 100% right. I think most adults really are cordial and don't really care. But I will share a story with you, a true story that happened to me just a year ago. Just a year ago. I was on my way, I was driving. I live in North Hollywood. From North Hollywood, I went to Sacramento for a conference. And I pulled over to use the restroom because I my last vice that I have in life besides scotch is coffee. And I drink a lot of coffee. It's like my lifeblood. So I stopped to use a restroom. And I went into the women's restroom because that's what I use, right? I don't, it, trust me, I'm not going into the men's room looking like this. And I went into the women's room, and it was a very small women's room, only two stalls in there. So I was in and out in no time. But as I walked out in the interim, someone had walked in. And I guess it was a grandmother and her grandkids. And she saw me come out, and she gasped, and grabbed her grandkid, and pulled her away from me. And that so affected me, as if, like, what are you thinking? Like, I think in her head, she felt like I was a pedophile <coughs> or something. She was so taken aback by the fact I was in that restroom, I mean, I had to stop for gas, but I drove two more exits before I stopped for gas because I was afraid she was going to call a cop. That's here in California. So it's not just us and the cordial adults who are in this conversation. Those people are part of this conversation, too. And there are, as you can see in the news, lots and lots of them who don't want someone like me around their kids because they don't get it. They just don't get it. So how do we remove that by what we're building so that it's okay? Great big question mark that I don't know the answer to. Well, and just to, to further this, I think, Jackie, you and Catherine both, both kind of touched on uh, anxieties in this political climate. That, like, what do you see as the impact? I, I, I almost was going to list some quotes, but they're kind of too disturbing of our uh, government officials at the moment. But what do you see the impact on LGBTQ legal rights? Or what do you see as any anxieties? You can imagine. Okay? You can imagine how the current political climate is real beyond words to people in our community. I think, in some ways, part of the concern may not be necessary because we do have legislative protection, right? Gay marriage is here. It's equal. The country supports it. I don't really think that's going away. I can't imagine a shift in this country at the level of every human being are going to be so upset that that's going to go away. I really don't. I think some of the protections that aren't written in stone, like how to interpret transgender as part of, what is it, title line? I always get that confused. If that's protected or not, I used to say all the time at the center that I always thought, you know, being trans, the transgender issue was the caboose on the train. It was that final car coming around the bend. And we really thought we were going to be protected too. And now we're not. We don't have any protection to say it's not okay to treat us differently. 
except maybe in some places, isolated. But if I travel, I need to be really cognizant of where I am and what restrooms I'm using. There's a conference in Atlanta, and I purposely booked the hotel where the conference was so that if I needed to, I could run back to the restroom because I wasn't sure how things in Atlanta were going to play out if I walked in. Of course, it was also the NRA convention, so that was pretty cool. <laughs> Rides on the elevator, can you imagine? Only one who doesn't own camouflage right here. But, so, so this is a real thing. So those protections aren't there. They're, they're just not. So the impact, I think, is beyond words because I think now we thought we were right there. Maybe we're back 10, 15, 20 years to have to start this conversation all over again to say, get past the window dressing. People are people. And I know we have a lot of drama in our community. A lot of it because people can't bear being in a world that's hostile to them. So that drama is kind of understandable, but people see the drama and not the people behind it. And I think that's where we lose it. So yeah, so I'm worried. I'm worried, and quite frankly, I say huge. I say it the same way. You know, I'm from New York, so you would think I have a little bit of sympathy, and, and I am deeply, deeply concerned. I would just offer, um, I actually want to have California cut itself off from the rest of the country and us just float out while this whole mess in Washington happens, because I just, it is very, very difficult. Um, it's very difficult. I remember telling my children, I'm going to fight my battles, and I don't want you fighting those same battles. So I was very involved as a young person in Planned Parenthood. I was very involved in lots of things where um, uh, Latina advocacy leadership work, uh, women's rights, you name it, I was doing as a young person. And I remember that echo, you know, that said thing I said to my children when they were little, I said, you're going to fight new fights. And they're fighting the same fights now. I mean, we, are, we have taken a generation back. Not just a ten. We are taking a generation back. When you hear like General Kelly yesterday talking about women being honored, I'm like, I think I, that's an apron. It could involve an apron in the kitchen. That's what it felt like when I heard that. I was like, I haven't heard people talk like this so candidly about women in that way. And I know where it came from, but I also grew up. I, I mean, it just, it just. It just really, really stung when I heard him say that because it felt dated, like really dated. So, to me, California is going to mark a line in the sand. The country will come, the country will join, because the most of the country is along our lines, whether it's climate, whether it's um, civil rights issues, whether it's how we protect those with lesser needs, uh, lesser means than we do, we have. So whether it's health care or access to education, we're going to take care of those people in California. But you step outside of this state and there's a lot of problems. And so we're spending a lot of money and we're very lucky to be here. And I tell all my students, stay in California, preferably Los Angeles, but stay in California because all the opportunity is here. We are a living laboratory for lots and lots of things, whether it's social issues or, you know, all kinds of interesting uh, stem cell, you name it, we're going to do it. That's why all these interesting companies are starting here. But I just say that this is not a time to be complacent. This is a time to take up arms, to participate, to engage. I was at my church in All Saints and, and our, our, our pastor, she was saying, now is the time for uncomfortable conversations. Now is the time. Because right now I feel like it's it's important, you know, when... when uh, <laughs> When uh, Trump won, I didn't think, it, you know, like, okay, well, I've been through many, many cycles, and I've been through the Bushes, and I've been through, you know, all these different Republicans. I'm like, well, how bad can it get? And you're thinking, EPA is going away, and he wants to get rid of all kinds of different departments, and I, I'm like, he wants, I, I just, everything that comes out, it's incredulous to me. And the fact that trans are not being allowed to enlist and participate in our armed services, and the voluntary armed services is beyond me. And so, you know, it's one of those times when we really need to take stock. We cannot let this go because it will not get better. It will not get better. So all I'm asking is that you kind of, you know, um, I don't want to get into World War III. 
I don't want to have our economy completely tank again, because I lived through a few of those, and it was very painful. Um, I want us to um, really, really thrive as people and families. My concern is, is that we have someone who is really putting us in a course correction that's going to take us two generations to get back on track. What opportunities for advocacy are there in terms of building codes, internal company policies, uh, or outward facing client relationships? How, how do we make this decision? Jackie wants me to answer that. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're in the perfect so position, you know, because I mean, I'm, I'm like trades, you know, but you're in the design part of things, so you probably have a better answer than I do. But except that I, I'm just thinking about it, going, what the city, the uh, plan checkers. I'm not. Uh, codes are not are not up to date with what's happening in the world around us, and um, and I understand what you're saying about California because it is fabulous, and, and the rest of the country is way behind, and, and it's unfortunate. But I think they are going to catch up. Um, I don't I don't know how to answer that. I think so that um, we just need to, to go out there and tell them more, and then argue and sit there in front of them. And, then meeting the building department and saying this is how it's going to be, and, or we have to make it work this way because this is the time that we're changing and have your council members part of it, have, have everybody part of these discussions because that's how we can get things done. And we just need support and we do need to be vocal about it. So, because nobody knows or nobody wants, won't bring it up on their end if we don't bring it up to them. So, if I'm answering the question. Okay. And, and again, I have to plead ignorance because I'm on the like knock down the walls side of thing generally. Um, but I think nobody's ever asked us, right? Nobody's ever said what works for you guys. I bet you when code was written, however many years ago, no women were at the table to say, hey, you know what? We probably should have some extra stalls in that bathroom because I want to see the second half of the show and not miss the first 15 minutes. Right? So I don't know what the answer is, but maybe, and I think Kevin, you touched on this, yeah. we need to be at that table. We need to say when these things are being written. I don't know how we get to the table, but I think we damn sure have to be part of it. Oh no, Jackie, absolutely. No, we, okay, so all of you, go to your resumes. Check and see how much time you have to go either on a state commission or a local board local organization and you can absolutely be part of the things that we're talking about because these are things as I said are not going to change unless we all participate and all of you are touched by the issues that we've talked about the, the things that we carry that we're just like we have to carry this extra load but you know that there's people in your family or that you care and love for and care about that are going through this same stuff they're walking amongst us because they're either you know, living out or not living out or trans or struggling, and you know that. And it's just not going to get easier unless all of us look at our resumes and see how much time we have to be able to contribute and do our part. And I really applaud the Women in Green for allowing this panel because this is the first time I've actually done a panel like this. And I have not. I've intentionally not because you can tell I'm kind of an emotional person about these issues. They're very private. The stuff we go through is very private. And so the fact that we're sharing, and I appreciate my colleagues kind of being very open about how hard it is. And, you know, I don't want it to be that hard. It shouldn't be that hard for us to live equally amongst everybody else. And so look at your time. Look at what you can do. How can you contribute? It matters because I am in the environment where I have to deal with so many, you know, there's so much lack of understanding and lack of willingness to engage because, you know, oh, well, someone got killed because they were, you know, trans and they got hunted down. Oh, well, there goes another person. That's not the way we should live. We should live in a way that people can be open, authentic, and not be afraid to walk the streets. Not be afraid to walk into, you know, I mean, we talk, but as women, by the way, as women, we always walk around in fear. We can't just go, you know, it's so funny. I was going to take a bike ride the other night, and my wife was like, I don't think that bike it, lane is lit. And it was at night, and she's like, I said, it's not lit. Hmm, maybe I won't go on that bike ride. 
you know? I mean, it's every single experience that we share, that we know we can be assaulted. And now, you know, you hear about all these people in Sacramento, because when I was running for office, these women in the Women's Caucus, you know, like, we talked openly about how easy it is for people to just violate us, as if we're there for them to do that. And I, you know, and women come to me in the industry and they say, well, I'm standing in line for food at a conference and this guy just reached over and groped me. And I'm like, don't stand up for this. We are human beings with rights and integrity. And I'm just asking you, because you're here, and I'm so glad you're here, because it was early. And it took a lot to get here in that traffic. So thank you. But also thank you for listening to us. Thank you for actually taking the time to hear our stories. It matters so much to me that you are here, that you appreciate, that you care enough to, to come and to, and to listen to what's going on in our world. Thank you. Uh, before we end, uh, we have some Q&A. Just remind me to Oh, okay. So good. Uh, if you haven't already, you have a question you'd like to, to post to the panel now, please uh, grab one of the cards at your table and, and write something on it. Uh, do we have some questions to, to start with? For my later Eric Garcetti does it too. <laughs> yeah, good. I, I got this from Eric uh, Garcetti, um, Eric Garcetti. He was like, okay, everybody smile. <laughs> and it was always very good. We <laughs> see ourselves on Twitter. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. So we take a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, I, I apologize if I stumble over this one a bit. Uh, Catherine noted women tend to be tend to be or bear the caretaking role in communities and families. I see so many amazing women who are in government positions in LA who are caretakers of our wonderful city. However, they do not seem to have the power positions. How do we help highlight and elevate women doing amazing jobs, uh, taking care of our city socially and infrastructure? What else? We are at a lucky time. Who asked the question? Julie Root. Uh, <laughs> so we are at an interesting time. Salita Reynolds, rock star, right? Deborah Flint, rock star. We have some amazing women who are doing fantastic and transformational things. I mean, those are the things that, that we have to help, you know, in terms of acknowledge um, and recognize that they are, it's a lonely field. When Gail Goldberg was our uh, planning director in Los Angeles, before she was planning director in San Diego, and I, I come from planning, she was the only head of planning woman that I knew of. She is my mentor. And so I, I went to her and said, would you be my mentor? Because you're the only planning director of a big city. And she said, sure. She's my, one of my best teams in my life. And you know what? You kind of look around and you're like, how many white men can we have running the show? It's like you got plenty. And then when I look at panels, and this is one of the things I have a big criticism about, these manals, man panels. And it's like, <laughs> I guess 52% of the population has no opinion about things. So I always, I really try and get, you know, when you, when you hear about an opportunity for somebody to participate or somebody's getting an event together, hey, make sure there's diversity. Hey, make sure there's a woman on there. Make, and this cop that, well, we couldn't find any qualified. No, there's plenty of qualified by women to participate and engage. So just be aware. The optics are important. That is really, really, really it for me to have people say, you know what? I heard this woman on this panel. By the way, she may be the only woman, but she was there. So let's make sure that we, we are voiced, we, we have our voice, we make sure that we have our, our perspective where it needs to be. Can people just get up and just ask? You can do that too. Because it's a, it's a nice intimate. Uh, She's not. Before we do that, uh, what can we do to communicate that a workplace is LGBT friendly? We have a great big banner outside. <laughs> <laughs> you can't miss the place. Bright rainbow colors. You know. <laughs> Our office is actually working on the LGBT center. So. Yeah, which was which was an odd coincidence when I found out. Yeah, your firm is doing the heavy lifting with the center. 
All the good. That's why she was saying all these great things about us. <laughs> it's really true. I, you know, you know where I'm from. I don't pull punches, and I don't impress easily. I am totally impressed with you guys. Um, and the other thing is, I think. Like I said, I think the office itself is, has um, has always tried to incorporate LGBT um, events and, and ask us at anybody, not just the few people in the office, but um, ask everybody if they want to attend these events and fundraisers or whatever it is. And, and, and I think that's probably a good way to, for offices and firms and to incorporate everybody, everybody to um, participate. Well, Brittany's head of our Connect, um, Connect Us, Connect Out. We have uh, at Arab, we have this great family around the world of LGBTQA folks, and we have events, and we watch movies together, and we go out and do things, and we have fun times. So, we, at our office, um, at my at my company before, which I was co-owner with my wife and another business partner, we always try to um, acknowledge uh, like things like Harvey Milk Day. We would just, you know just give homage to those people who have um, stepped in front of us. And so we would give, uh, we would do things like a AIDS uh, walkathon or something. We would just go do stuff. We would, we would make sure to help different organizations and just um, live it and be it. You know, it's kind of like you can talk about it, but you gotta be it. So that's what, what I think any firm, anybody could do to really show their support um, for the LGBTQA community. So certainly, if anyone would like to grab a mic, you're welcome to, to ask a question. But this one, while I have it, uh, there are a lot of similarities in the issues you're facing in other communities, i.e. people of color. What opportunities do you see for cross-sectional engagement to improve this space? Well, that's, that's a really interesting one. But for us, you know, because of who we are, and not just the center, but we do so much outreach in the Black and Latino communities, and so much of that community is part of our community. For us, I think that overlap already exists. Yeah. I mean, that's one thing I have to say. Our place is not totally populated by old white guys, although we do have some um, <laughs> legacy, but we do have that diversity in there. And I, I don't think it's on purpose. Like, we want to hire people just because we need to check off a box, but they already exist. They already exist, and then they come on because they have the talent to be on. And I think that's really where we need to get, right? It doesn't matter. Everything else is window dressing and backdrop. It's, does the person have the talent, or are they a good person? And then they come on. Well, a lot, a lot of LGBT, well, a lot of uh, LGBTQA community uh, groups, organizations are partnering with MALDEF and uh, human rights efforts. Um, uh, immigration, energy, uh, environmental groups. So we already do a lot of that bridge building amongst each other so that we can actually make sure that we're kind of coming. So whether it's people of color or um, folks who are particularly at risk, um, immigrants and immigrants' rights organizations, those folks, the most vulnerable seem that we coalesce because we have common um, concerns and, and vulnerabilities. So we already do that mostly. Great questions. Oh, what kind of training does your organization do around gender fluidity? For example, are you promoting gender neutral language? And how are millennials influencing this effort? And how does it affect the role of women? <laughs> well, obviously, because of who we are, yes, we do. We have mandatory trainings for trans, bisexuality, etc., etc. People are very good about sharing their preferred pronouns. A lot of people will put on their signature pages for their email their preferred pronouns. So, and I think that came about because in one of our all staff meetings with all 600 plus people, a couple of the younger people brought this up. So I don't go by he, she, I prefer they or some gender neutral pronoun. So that became a discussion among 600 people spontaneously. Which then led to us, you know, having a committee because, of course, you got to have a committee, right? <laughs> and, and then that was the answer. We we now put it if we care so much, or I should say that came out wrong. So I don't mean it like that. But if if we're not, we don't fit the profile, 
that we put it right on our signature page. So when someone, they might get my name Jackie, and then on the bottom, you know, preferred gender pronouns would be she, her, hers, and then everybody knows, and it's just a simple fix. Clever. I think, I think we don't have that training just yet. I'm not thinking can we go to No, we were, uh, this is fascinating, because we had a push question one day into that point, but I don't know that uh, we are there, so. I think we could do that. Yeah. I think we could. Because I think it is important. I think the millennials, I'm, I'm not, a, I'm a Gen Xer, so I'm, I'm learning all of this on candidly. I'll just out myself on that way. I'm still learning when someone comes up to me and says, these are my preferred pronouns. I'm like, ooh, okay, I'm note to self, right? So I, I'm, I'm on that curve of educating myself. And so for me, it would be very helpful to have that training so that we do give people an opportunity to actually say, this is how I prefer to be um, identified in my workplace and to be respected in that way. And, and it's not always a big conversation. I mean, I'm almost embarrassed to say I'm a baby boomer. Um, so I get it wrong too, all the time. <laughs> and then I feel terrible when I do, because of course, if anyone should be conscious of gender pronouns, it should be me. I get misgendered sometimes. Rel I don't say relatively often, but often enough. I try not to make a big deal about it. I try to keep a sense of humor about it. But it's kind of a fine line, too, because yesterday I was on the phone with someone, and it was for a medical appointment. They had an old record with my old name on it, and they said him. And then I corrected her, the nurse that called me, and I said, oh, no, actually, it's Jackie. That's she. And she was mortified. And then I felt terrible. I was like, oh, my God, it's okay. No, no, really, it's not a big deal. I just want to let you know. She goes, oh, I'm so sorry. I feel so bad. And, you know, I'm really glad you told me because I want to know this. And this poor thing on the other end of the line is like, no. <laughs> and so it's, yeah, so it's kind of a balancing thing, too, you know? It's like we're trying to win hearts and minds. We don't do that by hitting people over the head. It's like, it's okay. Natalie, I'll see you Friday. <laughs> sort of hindering or helping um, awareness or acceptance of the LGBTQ community. And I've come at this from sort of my thought processes in today's day and age, we can be more isolated than ever, really isolated. So social networks, we can get any food delivered to our door within a minute. We have unlimited call plans. We can talk to people on the phone all day. So you can really isolate yourself. And, and I feel like, you know, Jackie said earlier, people are people, and once people get to know you, it's not an issue, but it's the initial sort of reaction. And as we have maybe less social interaction, or the possibility for less social interaction, is that affecting you, you know, question mark? That actually is a phenomenal question, because I think it's a two-edged sword. Um, I just read a thing yesterday or the day before, about 74% of millennials would rather have contact with people electronically than in person. So I think that's really a dangerous, slippery slope to go down when we separate people from our screens and not have that communication, but on the plus side, you know, like when I was a kid, yeah, a child of the 60s and 70s, there was no education. There was nowhere to go to find out what was going on with me. It wasn't until I was in college, and I could get into a college library to try and find out, like, what's going on here. And then when I found the answer, it was in the DSM-3, and it told me I had a psychological problem. Right? So, oh, okay. But that's what it took. It took me going to a physical library and a card catalog and go hunt through the stacks to find a book to read about what was going on with me. But now with the internet, these kids who are young and struggling, they, they can get an education. And maybe not, it's not all perfect, but at least it's out there. When I was 12, I didn't know what the word transgender was. I had no clue. That's what was going on. And yet now, at the center, you know, we have youth housing, we have programs for young kids, and now there are kids who are 14 and 15 years old transitioning, and I'm thrilled for them because they're getting it early. At some point, their lives will be much easier because they were smart enough and had the information to start their transition 
at a point where it really makes a difference instead of waiting until their late 40s and trying to undo all the things that came about or, or happened just because of a lack of knowledge. So I really think it goes both ways. I completely agree. Because I, I know that I myself have learned so much about what's happening in the world around, the, around me because of social media. And if I didn't have that, then I would know like a lot of things. Like North Carolina, for instance. If you, if you are introduced to the topic and then you want to learn more because of what's happening over there. But who, you know, 20 years ago, who cares about North Carolina, right? I mean, I do. It's a great little study. But, um, but it's, it's good to know. And then it's good to know that there are people fighting over there. And it's unfortunate that they have to do that by themselves out there right now. But um, it should affect all of us. And I, growing up, yeah, it didn't have anything but libraries. And, and you have to basically touch a book. And today, you can just go and check out Instagram or Facebook or, or Twitter. Yeah, or Google something, a topic, and hopefully something is not fake news and we can uh, actually read what it says. And... Do we have any other questions? Oh, yes. Hi. I think there's something very interesting happening right now in the uh, zeitgeist um, up around the um, boundaries of private, professional, work, uh, personal uh, life. And um, I just, I was listening to NPR coming here, and um, it was a very interesting interview of a woman who was talking about the Me Too phenomenon, and uh, talking about how they were unable to differentiate between when in a workplace environment people were uh, being personal for a uh, predatory kind of way or, or, you know, anyway, this, this idea that in the workplace, you know, where are the boundaries of how you interact with someone, how you talk to them about their lives? Because we spend, you know, at least eight hours a day with this group of people. So do we keep them completely separate from our personal life, or do we bring them in? And there have been some different perspectives, I think, up here. And I, I'm interested in, in talking about that, especially for young people who this work is, it's consuming. You know, you spend a lot of time at work. How do you keep the boundaries in the right place without it being like, I don't have any personal investment in the people that I'm working with? I think that's probably one of the hardest things, especially for those of us who are in management, because I think it's hard to work with people day in and day out. We put in long days. It's 10, 11 hour days are really common. 12 hour days happen all the time. It's hard to work with people all the time and not even learn to love or hate them, right? I mean, things kind of crystallize. And we always talk about, we call it our facilities management team, our fat man team. We're like a family. We have good days, bad days. At the end of the day, we're all around the table and love each other. I think the hard thing is being true to both relationships that you have to have. One is, I think to be an effective manager, you have to have a human relationship with people. You have to know, are they married, not married, have a partner, do they have kids, do they have a dog, what they like and don't like. Just on a human level, you need to be able to connect to be effective. But you can't forget, you also have a responsibility for whoever you're working for. And it's hard to walk that balance. I mean, I've had to turn people I care deeply about because the situation was that they could no longer be where we were. So as much as I cared about them personally, I had to be true to this other relationship that I was responsible for inside the doors and say, our relationship has to end. I think that's the most complicated thing we do, is where is the line? Because we reach a comfort level. And we talk to each other and we banter, and maybe sometimes the banter pushes the lines of what's respectable, not respectable, what goes over the top. At a certain point, 
the back of our heads, we have to say, okay, my responsibility starts here. We have to, however we make that judgment, here's the line. And now I have to, for this little bit of time, stop being your friend, your mentor, you know, the person who holds you when you're struggling. And I need to be your boss for a few minutes. It's complicated. But you have to have both. I don't think you can have one or the other and be good at what you do. I don't know how you get out of people if you don't have both. I was just going to say, it's such a difficult uh, question and, and what you're saying. I, I don't know how to get close to someone and find out about their personal life and then have to go through that and tell them, well, it's over, you can't work here anymore, and now do you have to worry about them coming back and saying, well, you knew me, so I'm going to sue you now. And, you know what I mean? It's just everything is getting so, so touchy. Really. I don't know what, what, what to call it, but it's a very touchy subject. And, it's very difficult, and and, that, and this goes back to the construction site when you're sitting with clients and contractors, and how much do you tell them, and how much do you allow them in, so that because you want to become close to them because they're all being close to each other and telling everyone's stories, but then do we really want to hear everything that I mean directed at you, like, even if it's good? I mean, it's just that I don't know that we want to be at that level, or I want to be at that level. This goes to people I work with. I mean, how much do you really want to tell people, and how much? Because you don't want to make people uncomfortable, and you don't know what's going to make them uncomfortable at the end of the day. So it's, it's a very difficult, it's like very, very difficult. And I think it's a very um, trying time right now because I, I think we're all, everyone is trying to figure it out. Like, how far do you go? How far do you keep your mouth shut? I mean, what's personal? What's like public? And I think that's. You know, as a, as a supervisor, it is very difficult because you have to be, um, you have to be, you know, you have to be their boss. You have to make sure that things, you know, things are met, timelines, deliverables, blah, blah, blah. Um, but you're a human being, too, right? And you care about people's well-being. Um, I'm very, very mindful of the different sensitivities of people. There are some that are very, you know, just like, I work here, just leave it alone, you know, don't. Right. Just and you can just tell. I really respect those boundaries. And when they decide to say, "Oh, by the way, I'm breaking up with my partner," and I'm like, "You know, I'm sorry. If you need extra time, yeah, I let people let themselves into my space because I'm so darn open. You can tell, like, you know, whatever. I have nothing to hide. I have nothing to hide. So I am I like like a book where some people don't want to be a book, and they will only share certain pages with you." And you can just, you have to respect that space. And so I, I'm really careful about just people's well-being. There was one person in my office, she looked terrible. She looked terrible. And I said, you know, are you sick? Are you okay? Because she looked really sick. And she's, well, I'm having a hard time at home. And I said, well, you know, why don't you take some time off? Why don't you just, if you want to leave the office, don't worry about it. I just wanted her to know, I didn't need to know and all the details. I'm supporting her. I'm so, Whatever your situation is, I don't need to know. I support you. So she felt better, and then the next day she came back. She says, "Thank you. I just needed some time to take care of some things." Fine, you know. So it's really a case by case and person by person because you don't know what they're going through. Every single one of you, I don't know what you're going through, but whatever it is, there's hard stuff, there's easy stuff, there's complicated stuff, and and that was one of the things that I have learned in, in my paths is that every single person has their own journey. You don't know where they are. They come into the office, you don't know where they are. They could be on a path. You don't know. So you, all you can do as a supervisor and in today's world of just being, I'm available to support you. Um, you know, what do you, what do you need from me to um, assist you? But also know that I don't need to know anything more than you're willing to tell me. Because I just, I, I don't probe, I just don't ask. I didn't know somebody had kids like for a long time and when this one person said, yeah, I'm dealing with my kids, I'm like, okay, so I locked that away, saying maybe this person might have a different schedule and stuff like that. I just, you know, as a human, you try and relate. But I'm really careful about boundaries because people, some people are hypersensitive. Like, there are some people in my office, like, they just, you know, I, I'll go have a piece of uh, a cup of coffee and that's it. And then there's others like, you know, let's go off on a weekend doing stuff, like skiing. Like that, but just like skiing. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I think, I'm sorry. 
I think one of the things that complicates that whole thing is, again, from both sides, both perspectives, I think men in business relationships, they start with a wall. Right? There's this protocol, there's this norm of we're not touchy-feely, we're not personal. I don't care yes. about what's going on. Like, I don't. And then gradually that wall starts wearing down and maybe you spend a lot of time in a truck together. And when, in my old life, I worked with my brother for a while and his wife used to go out of her mind because we used to spend, we used to work 20 and 30 hour shifts on a regular basis. And we'd be in the truck and she would say, well, what did you guys talk about to my brother? And we're like, nothing. Like, how can you be in a truck for 30 hours and not say nothing? Like, do you want coffee? Yeah, let's go for coffee, right? So that's, that's where men start. But I think for women, because the natural instinct, and this isn't a stereotype, I mean, I think this is just a fact, are more nurturing. If there is any wall, it starts way lower and is much more open. And if anything, someone's got to work at building that wall. So the baseline is to be caring and want to know, and like you said, maybe they don't want you to know, but I think the receptiveness is there. So the relationships for women to each other, male or female, that worked for them, I think just starts at a whole different baseline than it does for men. You know, it's like, I used to use the phrase, say it walking. You know, like, I didn't want to hear it, or I didn't have time for hearing it. It was perfectly acceptable in that life to not care so much because I was busy, whereas now I'm busy and someone comes to talk to me, I for sure don't say I only have five minutes. I put my phone down or I stop answering my email and then we talk for as much as is almost always necessary. I just want to add, it is complicated. Um, I'm trying to be mindful about how I even refer to people. The other day, a colleague of mine, he came and he checked in with me on something. I, I said, okay, thanks, sweetheart. You know, I didn't mean it like that, but it's just like, or thanks, hon. You know, and I don't want to be like that. And I turned to him. I said, I'm sorry. He says, No, it's cute. I'm like, okay, with him, that's okay. But I don't want others to hear. I'm like calling him sweetheart, right? But it is, I, I, you know, it is, it is easy to slip right now. But it's in that moment, say, Oh, you know, I really apologize. Um, I don't, you know, because you just don't know. And I think we need to be mindful about how we're operating in this kind of very different time. And I, I'm just kind of confessing that to you, like, hot sweetheart. <laughs> I'm all scared now. <laughs> and really quickly, on what you said, Jackie, I, um, if you try to be, if as a woman you try to be different than what their perception is, they always ask, what's wrong? What's, what's going on? And it's like, I just don't want to talk to you right now. <laughs> so I, I know what you mean. Yeah, because it definitely is that the men have a certain and if you try to be that, or if you just don't feel like it, like being that stereotypical woman, then they think there's something wrong with you. And that's probably goes back to work and construction. Yeah. Well, clearly it's that time of month. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say that. But baseline assumption. <laughs> oh, boy. Here we go. Right. I mean, and that's so unfair. It's so unfair because nobody should have to play it being open or not open. I mean, if you don't want to have a conversation, you shouldn't have to justify why you don't have to want to have a conversation because you were born with a certain set of chromosomes. I don't get that. I, so I, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on, on this discussion in that, um, so one of the things that I was thinking about is this idea of rights and responsibilities. So our right is to be private and have privacy. And at the same time, we have a responsibility to convey to the world, to the community that we're in, whether it's work or wherever, what it is that we want and how we want it. So in other words, there's no assumptions. Um, uh, someone grabs me or says something, calls me sweetheart, or uh, demeans me in some way, or demeans my intelligence. Um, it's my responsibility in that moment to correct it and not swallow it down and you know say, hey, you know, whatever, I'm making excuses. And so that's kind of an interesting, to me that's very interesting. We have, I have people in my very small organization uh, who are transgender and we've had a lot of conversations about the responsibility to 
say right up front, uh, you know, my pronoun, that my preferred pronoun, how, you know, uh, no, that's not correct, eyes up here, buddy, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, so I, I thought maybe that would be part of uh, what we need to talk about as both women and also uh, people of the LGBTQ community. Thank you. Uh, I hope we have time for one more question. I'll go over here. Okay. Split up. Split up the room a little bit. Thanks so much for sharing your uh, stories and perspectives. Um, oh, closer? Okay. So uh, my question is, what do you feel are some of the best resources available for leaders, um, organizations, and even communities, um, maybe cities or municipalities, to facilitate environments of diversity? We don't. Well, yeah, I'm sure we do, but again, I'm the facilities person. So those things, you know, that's another department, and I don't want to say anything at a turn. I think, honestly, the best thing for me that helps is each other. I always think that when you sit in a room like this at a conference with colleagues and peers, we are our own best resource. We all face the same problems, we all have the same challenges. We brainstorm, I know Karen, we have our own little facility subgroup for another group that we belong to. And we feed off each other and we find our answers together. I don't know on a big global scale how that works, but I think the best thing that's ever happened to me in belonging to things like this, especially since I've transitioned, is to find the relationships from people I've met at conferences and meetings just like this, and getting to know people personally so we can pick up the phone and go, what are you guys doing? Like, this thing just came up. Do you guys have anything? I mean, we do that all the time. And for me, that's a blessing. You know, because we're all, otherwise we'd all be reinventing the wheel. So again, on that global city type scale, I don't know. But I never take for granted the amount of talent and the amount of intelligence that is out there if I just reach across the table and say, help me, pick it out. There's a, there actually is at the LGBT Center at Equality California, there's a lot of private consultants that will come in and actually look at your organization, your department, your agency, and they will help you customize uh, kind of a, a, a program, <coughs> not a program, but like a training, a training, and particularly in today's world of there's, there's the trans community, but there's just the identification and how we, we address issues. I think it's really incumbent upon all of us to kind of say, okay, where are the holes here? Where, are we, where, where do we need to kind of tighten this up a little bit so that we do, I mean, like you say, you know, we're an open and welcoming group, organization, company, firm, right? And so you want to do that, and maybe you're not there yet, and you need some help from somebody who really knows how to do that, and there's lots of um, resources, LGBT uh, Center and then Equality California are the two top ones that I know have resources on the website. There's lots of consultants that are specifically from different groups that will come in and help you. So please don't think like, oh my gosh, this is a big issue, how do we deal? There's lots of resources out there for everybody. We're going to take one more question. It's kind of like a follow-up from the question from Flora, because we talk about, um, like, sometimes, like, might get offended sometimes at workplace and people may not even aware of that. So I just I'm trying to figure out what's the best way to let them know about it, you know, like without offending them back, you know. Um, like I said, some like I work in their previous uh, company and um, there's no girls bathroom on the second floor, but there are two bathrooms. There are two bathrooms, but there are no girls bathroom. Second floor, I have to go downstairs to the girls', girls, girls bathroom. And it was like, you know, that's something that I could talk to my boss about, but I don't know because I know one of the bathroom is for the manage, managers, which is all guys. I was the only girl at that point in the group at that time. And then, like, or sometimes you'll be colleagues who heard of me. Or, like, I, I just don't know how to open up the conversation without, you know. <laughs> Can't you just ask them straight up and say, why is it that I have to go downstairs to use the bathroom? And, and not in a bad way, just, just sit down and say, how would you guys feel if, if you were me and I would have to go downstairs? Yeah, I guess it just, um, 
it's also like from the, my culture or whatever it is. Yeah. It's just sometimes it's hard to. It is very hard to start yeah. a conversation. It's a thing, and it yeah. can be that you know people of different backgrounds are resistant, reluctant to kind of say, "Hey, wait a minute, I have a problem here," and and it can really kind of get from just a bathroom to you violated. Right. So what you have to do is you have to take steps on your own. And this is just something we all go through as a Latina, as a woman who grew up in the sticks of Coachella before it became cool. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, I was, I was reluctant to raise my voice because I felt like it was out of place. It wasn't my place to raise my voice um, as, a, as a Latina. And I felt like it was important for me to just mind my own business. But think about it this way. If you would have said something, and now you're going forward, you maybe will, but there's somebody going to be behind you that's going to have the same thing. And so to address it and redress it, and to basically say, I just want to bring up a concern here that if you're not going to take care of it now for me, there's going to be some others probably behind you. You might want to address this. There's ways to kind of broach it, and there's ways to actually say, as she said, in the moment, you have to say, you know, I'm not sure I'm totally comfortable with the sweetheart. I know it was probably, you like me, and that's all charming. But I don't like that in my work. And then it, it gets fixed really quickly. It really gets fixed because that person in their mind says, I respect this person. I will not do this again. Now, if it continues, you got a different problem. But essentially, nip it right in the bud as it happens. Stay on your ground and really make sure that they respect you for the professional person that you are and that you shouldn't be just because you're a woman or you know, um, you're polite, that they should you know, take you for granted or take advantage of that. I agree. I just want to say, when somebody calls me sweetheart, I just say, my name's Melissa. There you go. <laughs> so it's not rude, but I'm not. I'm just like, my name's Melissa. Like, my name's my sweetheart. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> I told you, I did it. I do it, you know? <laughs> All right, I think um, we're just about out of time. I uh, just want to thank our panelists. Thanks, Brittany, for moderating. Um, I hope you guys all enjoyed yourself and the discussion today. Um, so just join me in giving them a round of applause. <laughs> and the, the other thing I wanted to mention, um, when we first started this group, we basically stole the idea from Green Mills. Um, any of you going to Boston, uh, sign up for the Women in Green Breakfast there. It is not sold out yet. It's like Russell said, it's probably the highlight of the show. It will be better than the Clinton. Probably. <laughs> I'm guaranteed. Plus, little, but it's always open in Green Mills. Um, anyways, if you are going, that's definitely like the next Women in Green Breakfast. These are kind of the local versions of those. Uh, but, anyways, we started back in 2013. We were always just kind of racking our brains, like, what would be interesting to talk about? <coughs> Who should we try and find? And then, you know, with our little network, we would find some panelists. Actually, Catherine was one of the first people we tried to yes. get, and she suggested her. her wife was a very strong environmental record. I offered And then wife. we were brainstorming <laughs> uh, with, with Brittany and Russell. And I was like, you know, Cecilia Solano was here, and she was amazing. We tried to get her wife, Catherine, and they were like, I'm talking about. <laughs> she works eight hours now. We're like, wait, get her off. <laughs> so, just kind of funny how that all worked out. But my point to all this is that um, people have been coming to us now with ideas for panels, themes for panels, potential panelists, and it makes our life as volunteer planners of this whole organization, this group, a lot easier. So if you guys have any suggestions on panelists or themes, um, that you want to cover, that you want us to address, we are happy to entertain those ideas, reach out to panelists. Uh, that's how this panel happened. That's how the last one happened, uh, where we had all the uh, leaders of nonprofits who are really on the resistance side um, here with Heather Rosenberg. So definitely email Melissa, me, um, the chapter office, and we would love to hear uh, your ideas on panelists. Because you guys all have a wonderful network and we want to celebrate those individuals as well. So thank you again for coming, and uh, don't forget to get validated. Uh, and we don't have another one on the books. I always want to have another one on the books to announce at this event, and we're just not organized for that, but soon we will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.